I was sort of a, a regular housewife buying the American Dream in 1978. I moved into this lovely home in Niagara Falls. It wasn't a spectacular home. It was a, a ranch, you know, three-bedroom ranch with a finished basement, a, a short distance from the Niagara River. I mean, huge Niagara River, five miles upstream of, of Niagara Falls. It had two elementary schools. It had churches. It had a convenience store. It was a perfect neighborhood. And so I moved in there with my husband and my one-year-old child, um, thinking I've just, you know, I've just made the American dream at, you know, 24 years of age. I mean, my parents waited so long, very happy. And then after living there for a while, Michael got really sick. Michael was healthy when he moved in. He developed um, liver problems, urinary tract disorder, which required two operations to correct. He developed asthma epilepsy. I mean, it was just one thing after the other. And I did not know about Love Canal. Nobody told me when I bought that ideal home in the ideal community that there was 20,000 tons of chemicals underneath the school that my son would eventually be attending. And so Michael got sick and sicker and sicker, and I kept taking him to the doctor and asking the pediatrician, and he had no clue. He's like, you know, God gave you this child because you're one of these moms that he knows will take care of him. It's like, no. God gave me a healthy child. Something is making him sick. It wasn't until I picked up the newspaper one day, and there was a series on hazardous waste done by Michael Brown in the Niagara Falls Gazette, and I looked at it, and it talked about 20,000 tons of chemicals underneath the 99th Street School and leaking out into the homes. And they had a list of all these different chemicals in there, and so I took it over to my brother-in-law, who worked at SUNY Buffalo, the university there. He's a biologist. And I said, Wayne, what are these chemicals? They say toxic chemicals. I don't know what that means. And he said, well, let me see. This one will kill about a million brain cells when you take one deep breath. And, and he went through this whole list. And I'm like, Wayne, Michael's really sick. Do you think these chemicals and him playing on the playground every day, even though he wasn't yet in school, um, could be making him sick? And he said, I have no doubt. And so I went to the school board and said, can you move Michael out of the school? By then he was in kindergarten, 1978. This is when the article ran. And they said, no, we cannot. Because if we move Michael Gibbs because of the potential threat, we have to move all 407 children. And I'm like, yeah, you need to move all 407 children. We're not going to do that. We're not closing a school because of one irate, hysterical housewife. And I went home saying, oh my goodness, I said, it's just unbelievable. And then I started to go door to door to my neighbors and said what I found. The, the city government was not moving. The county government shut the door in my face. The state government shut the door in my face. And obviously the school board, Dr. Long, who was the superintendent of schools at the time, slammed the door in my face. And so I did a petition and went door to door and said, look, you know, do you have problems with your kids? I think it's related to the school. But we never did have at, that, at the onset of discovery of the problem we never really understood the dimensions of what was happening at Love Canal. We truly believed that our children were getting sick as a result of playing on the playground or as a result of going to school there and playing on the playground. We didn't know it really was traveling into our homes and into our backyards and um, into our bodies in that way. The area where Love Canal was was a new neighborhood. You know, those homes were fairly new. So there was a lot of land where you could have built a school. You didn't need to build it there. It wasn't like um, you're in the South Bronx or something like that where you have a finite amount of property available. There was plenty of property available, and they chose that. And it was a dollar deal. Well, they knew that the property was contaminated. The school board knew that, and the city knew that. Um, they knew that there was industrial waste buried there because there was a waiver that said in the deed if we, anyone gets sick or harmed from our industrial waste, we will not be responsible. So they knew that. Whether they understood the depth of that, because we're really talking 1950 here, so it was a different world and a different understanding, is unclear. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but one thing that, that did happen is when it went to the Supreme Court, when the government tried to get their money back for the testing, the cleanup, the relocation of the Love Canal families, New York Supreme Court decided that Occidental Petroleum, in fact, did know more, did not disclose that information to the school board, not making the school board necessarily innocent, but less guilty than um, a lot of people think. And so they were held responsible for Love Canal, Occidental Petroleum, 
to the tune of $197 million. Huge price tag. Love Canal is, is named after Mr. William T. Love. It's really quite a unique story. Mr. Love was an entrepreneur, and what he wanted to do was connect the upper and lower Niagara River through this canal. What he essentially wanted to do was move the mighty Niagara Falls, as we call it locally, onto his property. And in doing so, he could harness the dropping of water and be a zillionaire because he would have this huge energy that he could sell to everybody. Unfortunately, he had part of the canal dug at both ends, and then money fell away, the depression set in, and he never completed his project. But, you know, he was, a, he was an interesting fella to think, oh, I'm just going to move the seventh wonder of the world over on my property, you know, really take all of the energy there and all of the money, and, you know, I, I can really be a good businessman. And it was, it was really, they have, we have some old photos of Mr. Love and some of his friends and colleagues, I guess, investors, actually digging, you know, with a shovel, sort of the, the, the ceremonial dig. And they had these big old top hats on and these old suits. And it's really very cool. But that's how I, it got its name. I think because it was named Love Canal and because we had Hooker Chemical Corporation, it helped us to get a lot of media attention because people would giggle about all of these associated names. So it, it added a little, a little play to the story. The canal was used for many, many years before a dump as a recreation area. People would swim, people would fish. It's actually connected to the Niagara River back then. So as the river rose, so did the canal, and it was fresh water, and it was quite lovely. Um, what Occidental Petroleum Hooker did is they bought that land, because it went up on, on auction, because nobody was paying taxes on it. They bought the land, they dammed off the place where it met the Niagara River, they pumped the water out of it in different sort of, they dammed it off in different sections. Um, and each section they pumped the water out and then they backfilled it with chemicals. And then they would move to another section and they would do the same thing. Our understanding is the city of Niagara Falls also buried garbage in there. So sanitary landfill was, was a part of that. And we also understand that the army, or the military I guess, um, dumped some of the Manhattan Project in there and some chemical warfare products in there um, that Hooker Chemical was making at the time. And there's like live testimony of people saying, you know, they were the ones who dumped it. They looked like beer kegs, but they had stripes on them. We had to wear moon suits and put them in there and cover them up immediately. So what's in Love Canal, nobody really knows. We know there's over 200 chemicals that they have found but how much of the Manhattan Project, how much chemical warfare stuff, what kind of exotic chemicals are there, is really no one really has a r real good handle on. And the other thing that's really kind of scary is that you don't know what chemicals are there that were created from the chemicals that were buried there. So, you know, when they mix all up, then what do we have? And what does that mean? And it's that reason that they decided from the beginning not to dig Love Canal up and do something with it, but rather leave it in place and see if they can contain it. I was actually shocked when I went door to door and started talking to people and asking them, do you have this problem, do you have that problem, what's going on? We had 56% of our children, this is a five-year period, so we didn't go all the way back, but five-year period, 56% of our children were born with birth defects three ears, double rows of teeth, extra fingers, extra toes, or mentally retarded. There were these three women who lived side by side, not genetically related in any way. All three of them had children born with the exact same birth defect, which was the children didn't have a hole in the top of their skull when they were born, so their skulls can't grow, and obviously their brains can't grow. They could correct it with surgery, but it was just, you know, those kind of stories when I went door to door. We had a 21-year-old who died of crib death. I don't think so. I mean, some of this stuff was just, um, we had a young girl who was 12 years old who had a hysterectomy due to cancer. I mean, it was just bizarre when we heard these stories. But we really looked at the health impacts we found. Um, during that same study period, there were 22 women, 22 women who were pregnant. Um, at the time of the study, and only four babies were born normally. 
the other pregnancies ended in miscarriages, stillborn babies, or birth-defected children. High rate of urinary disease, I mean the list goes on.